everyone. This is People in Power, and I'm Summer El Shahat. On today's program, is it Endgame in Afghanistan? <laughs> In the coming weeks, President Barack Obama is set to decide on the size, scale and timing of an American withdrawal from Afghanistan. Last week, the president's military advisers reportedly argued against the prospect of a substantial withdrawal, saying that leaving too early would threaten hard-won gains. The president's final decision will depend on judgments made about the effectiveness of a surge in U.S. troop numbers, which began last year. The White House hoped then that the additional soldiers would suppress the Taliban enough to allow an orderly handover to Afghan national forces. So has the surge worked? Filmmaker John D. McHugh was embedded with units from the U.S. 4th Infantry Division in the city of Kandahar and surrounding country, a part of Afghanistan that has seen some of the worst violence in the 10-year war. McHugh found that American claims that the surge had worked may well be true. Kandahar, the birthplace of the Taliban. Just weeks after he took office, President Obama announced his Afghan surge in an attempt to turn the tide in the war against the Taliban. With 30,000 extra troops now concentrated in the south of the country, the emphasis is on counterinsurgency, also known as COIN. The basic principle behind counterinsurgency is winning the populace, okay? The way COIN works is you go out every day, you, you show the people every day that you care, the government cares. It separates the government and the Taliban. The ta it shows that the Taliban are only here to hurt. You know, you go out, you explain to the people, you know, the Taliban don't care. They don't care whenever they blow up people. They're using 13, 14, 15 year old kids to, uh, to do suicide bombs. For the men of the 4th Infantry Division, coming to the end of a year-long tour, the past few months have been eerily quiet. Once these streets were a no-go area, now the atmosphere is much more benign. We've had more and more people come and uh, tell us information about the Taliban. You know, the Taliban are losing respect among the locals. I mean, in the past they saw them as Mujahideen, not so anymore. They see them as little gangsters. Uh, you know, they, they demand stuff from them. They come and they torment them. They intimidate them. That's not what the people want. So the Taliban are losing respect every day. When the 4th Infantry Division arrived in Kandahar a year ago, foot patrols like this through the city's bazaar would have been unthinkable. We'll go around, wave at them, shake their hands, go up, see how they're doing, see how business is going. If they have something to say, we'll tell them, hey, we'll come back later on tonight when uh, the crowds die down. But like going out today, just talking about people, security is great. And in the last few days, I don't know where it's all come from, but like people have actually been a lot friendlier. We didn't have one rock thrown with us in the last three days. He's a lot of beautiful jewelry. They even have time to go shopping. All real gold. My real friend be like, take it for free. Take it, take it for free. My real friend be like, take it for free. Free? Free. Oh, Real free. You say you're my friend. If you're my friend, if I had it, I would give it to you. No money. You just told me business was good. Money ticket. You told me business was good. Where did you guys get all this stuff? What's the Ilmanda, sir? Kandara, sir? Kabala, sir? The, the best things they could have done was embed us into a police substation. It's because right away you, you had no choice but to adapt to the culture. And we had the Afghan National Police teach us their culture. So when we came out, it made us that much easier to talk to uh, the local nationals. And uh, it made it, I guess, that much easier for them to open up to us, too, because we already understood their culture. It may uh, expose us to more risk, but I think it's very necessary. And like I said, it's, this war is going to be won by like, understanding their culture. And we understand, once you understand their culture, we understand how to get to the person. Because they, they are the target that we're trying to get to. We're trying to win them over. Oh, wow. You gotta get a little of this one over here. You only see those in zoos in America. In the beginning, they weren't as friendly, but since I, I think a lot of them are starting to recognize us, they see us every single day coming through the uh, 
the bazaar and through their villages and stuff, and they're more uh, welcome. They wave at us, and uh, they, they call us in for chai, call us in for food. So it's, uh, it's a pretty neat experience. But the relaxed atmosphere can change in a moment. Warned that a Taliban bomber may be in the area, the patrol search a suspicious car. Very good, Manana. Or a suicide bomber car driving around, and they saw one that looked like it. So. Does that make you nervous? Uh, a little bit, yes. They could just drive right in here and blow us all to hell. The caution is understandable. Three days ago, an IED, or improvised explosive device, went off up the street. Yeah, I uh, blew up last week on a collision forces. There were uh, like three local national injuries, no coalition force injuries. Pretty damn big. It was 155 pounds of uh, homemade explosives put under the culvert system. Boom, right onto a vehicle. And not everyone is convinced that things are getting better. The extra troops were placed here in anticipation of a major Taliban offensive. Historically, spring has always brought an escalation in violence. This year, so far, the Taliban are keeping a low profile. You know, I, I got to attribute that to uh, the coin that we're playing now, um, counterinsurgency. I've been here for eight months, and I've never been directly fired at. We've had multiple IEDs, but, you know, it's they say spring offensive, but I'm not saying it, brother. And then, so, where's, I can't see where the road is. The road is right here. At night, COIN means monitoring traffic in and out of the city, establishing checkpoints with the Afghan police to restrict Taliban movement. It's pretty important to make sure that they're strategically located within the city uh, to go along with the whole COIN concept. This is a real busy road, and to the north of us is basically, like, the beehive of uh, the Taliban in our area, or supposed, we think. And uh, we think this will disrupt a lot of any movement, freedom of movement coming through the area. Um, it's, it's basically the accessibility is the important part. To make sure that they're placed properly within the city so if something does happen, they respond within seconds. I uh, currently cannot go in reverse. It's causing a big traffic jam down the road. This is one of our busiest roads in our district right now. But sometimes, security gives way to the mundane and banal. A lot of them don't have the money to get a record to come out here and do it. And uh, we're not a free towing service or anything, but we go out and help, and it makes them happy. Oh, two more trucks broke down there, too? So the trucks are either stuck or broke down everywhere. Yeah. Then a call comes over the radio. Under cover of darkness, a special forces raid is in progress nearby. Hey, hey right, they want us out of the deep place with them. Are we in it? Yeah. yeah, they just called up, we're in it now. All right. The U.S. Army claims these special forces raids are essential to degrade the Taliban network. But they are controversial. Locals say they cause as many problems as they solve. Well, let, me, let me clarify something. It's when we do respond to an IED blast or if we get hit by an IED, we do not automatically think that village is our enemy. Not at all. Kandahar city is surrounded by pomegranate orchards. 
They have traditionally been used by the Taliban to hide weapons and mount attacks. US forces patrol and search them regularly, and over the winter months have found huge caches of homemade explosives, also known as HME. In the past they had a lot of, a lot of HME, but now they have to utilize what little they have. So they take, say, five pounds of HME, put it in a uh, directional fragmentation charge, put it in an old mortar round, and uh, they can focus it on one or two personnel and take one or two personnel out instead of taking five or six out like they have in the past. On the face of it, directional fragmentation charges, or DFCs, are a frightening new development. But the Americans say their use shows the Taliban are running low on munitions, another sign that their counterinsurgency strategy is working. I, I was skeptical at first, I felt like, but now I, I wish we'd started the counterinsurgency fight early. We set ourselves back by coming in so hard in the beginning. Just recently, within the past week, we found a very large cache. Uh, it was all new weapons. Uh, they were prepped for use, and uh, historically, they'd used the the orchards that we'd found them in to attack the uh, A and B checkpoints. So uh, we were able to confiscate that. Think about the disappeared dabs. We'll try to booby trap because they know that's what we're looking for. I don't know. Hopefully we can call uh, EOD out or come blow this thing up. I don't, I don't want to carry it back. They keep telling me the fighting season's coming any minute now, and uh, they said it was going to be uh, a month ago, and still nothing, and they told me it was two weeks ago, and uh, still nothing. Uh, I feel like what we've, what we've done has definitely stopped uh, any large-scale attacks from happening in this area. Firing in the hole! Firing in the hole! Infijar! Infijar! West of Kandahar city lies the Argandab Valley, spiritual heartland of the Taliban and long considered a safe haven. It was the scene of heavy fighting in 2010, but these days it's dotted with newly built US Army outposts, a security perimeter that's slowly encompassing once hostile territory. This base was established by a platoon of the 66th Armour Regiment. When we uh, arrived here last July, there was really no uh, U.S. or Afghan presence in the northwestern part of the Argandab River Valley, none. The Taliban had freedom of movement um, to drive up and down these roads or stay overnight in the villages, move their weapons or um, explosives wherever they wanted. Um, it's in a key intersection uh, location that's known for uh, Taliban travel. And um, basically, the villages that we cover to our south, this checkpoint makes it like a gated community someone wants to come into the area, they have to come through us or the Afghan army to drive through this area. Because of the influx prior to the fighting season of people coming in that uh, may be a danger to the population, we try to go through the villages and, and uh, kind of pull these people in for further questioning. So if we find someone that's suspicious, we can bring them in. We're disrupting uh, in the area because now people know uh, for the last few months that you know the unit that said Shaturi uh, They'll go out there and they'll find you. you know, if, if you're a stranger and they don't recognize you or they don't feel right about you, they'll pull you in. My area where we operate is, is a completely night and day sometimes from the area just across the river. Uh, and they have to understand those nuances very well in order to make things work. If you go off the, the ancient kind of, you know, the insurgent is the fish and he's protected by the, the sea, a lot of times people try to understand the fish first and, and really it's more important to understand that that ocean that he lives in, if you understand that better, uh, it's a lot easier to differentiate and find where that fish is. What, what was grown in here? What do you got growing? The little ones or the big ones? The big ones. Yeah. In home in America, I have the same thing. I have I have 
uh, big tomatoes, real big tomatoes. Yeah, we do target uh, insurgents quite a bit, but more so uh, we, we target what we do, call, it's called non-lethal targeting, essentially what we, we term it as. And that is the most important piece of what we do is, you know, so I better understand my population, the demographics, the, the occupations, the ages, what's important to them, the, the better I can help them with their development understanding the people and the population first and those things and that knowledge will lead you to understand your enemy better. These weekly meetings or shuras are an opportunity for the local elders to bring their problems to the Americans including their complaints about corruption, bribery and incompetence. Well, I mean, if it's a big problem, I'll just go down there. I'll just go down there and get it done. Uh -huh. No one's going to try to bribe me. I promise you that. <laughs> and really, like, those, those are the, the small victories when you, when you come off Bashura and the Malik has just said to you, you know, what you're doing for us now, no one's done for us in 30 years. Uh, that's what kind of gives you the feel to go another week. Every week you do the same thing over and over again. It's the small victories, and that's the stuff that doesn't really get measured uh, in the big picture. This time last year, every day you would hear gunfire, rockets, explosions. We don't hear that anymore. When I got here last year, this whole valley sounded like Vietnam, just every day. And um, we go weeks on end now without hearing explosions or gunfire, that type of thing. And it's definitely due to the surge. And there are troops everywhere, not just U.S., but Afghan troops, Afghan police. Um, we're, we're everywhere. And the Taliban, they, they have nowhere to go. We're at a uh, brand new Afghan National Police checkpoint, which is just south of uh, our combat outpost by about a click and a half. The issue we have is they set this up overnight very quickly, and they basically put up four walls. There's nothing here. And then they drop off a new group of Afghan policemen, and they expect them to live here and function and do their job. Um, and in a situation which we find ourselves now with literally no, no logistic support. Uh, these guys have no power. They have one little tent, um, very little food. Uh, they came to our outpost yesterday for water because they hadn't had water in three days. These guys are good gunfighters. Um, there's really not a lot we can teach these guys about fighting war because they've been doing it for so long. Um, so at least with the platoon that we're with, we're really like brothers. We go out and we do everything together. These guys are really good. The problem is, is that the Afghan government um, doesn't have a resupply system like we do. That's so a concern of mine, and once again, it's, this goes well above my level of experience, but it, a concern of mine is once we, we start withdrawing units, how is the Afghan resupply element going to be in place to... Uh, let these guys continue fighting, you know, because without without beans and bullets, as we say, what are you going to do? So uh, it's it's certainly something that needs to be addressed. So and I, I know that like the American people are anxious for us to get out of here and get home and stuff. But uh, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. You know, let's set these guys up for success. So in the future, we don't have to come back here. Yet out here, at the very limit of the U.S. Army's reach, vigilance is everything. There's still an ever-present threat of ambush and no apparent end to the hunt for Taliban weapons. We found uh, IEDs uh, and AK-47 ammo here before, so we're going to go in. Uh, we just got to be real deliberate about it because we found so many uh, caches that it's a good chance they've put in either PMMI or some type of booby trap or any tamper. So. Yeah, when you join the Army, you think uh, all that technology and stuff is good, but really the only way to find this stuff it's just a metal detector and a knife. 
you'd hear that from that. The city's what makes headlines, you know, you know population density and the, the reporting and things like that from there. This is just my opinion, uh, and, and I'm, granted, I'm kind of out on the edge of the world here. Um, it seems to me is that this is a last last gasp. So you look at the figures, so you see the IEDs are down like 90%. You see in uh, cash aid fines are up 70% around there. Uh, small arms attacks are down somewhere in the 80 or 90 percent. So you see these things, and, and, and what it tells you is that they don't have enough manpower, they don't have enough weaponry, they don't have enough bullets, they don't have enough HME and, and explosives. All these signs point to if you have a lower uh, level of supplies in order to conduct attacks, they're going to push those attacks into the Kandahar city because it's going to get a lot more publicity. So when everyone else in the entire world goes back and looks at it, they're going to say, oh, like they're looking to watch the news, oh, ah, Afghanistan's still bad, Afghanistan's still bad. Um, you know, they're attacking the government center, so it's got to be awful because they, you know, they kind of uh, push that like, well, you know, someone's attacking my, my state's government building or my, my, you know, the White House or something. You know, things else they got to write really bad, but that's normal stuff here in Afghanistan. This is the, one of the worst places in, in all of Afghanistan. This is the, the bastion, the, the home of the Taliban. No one got shot at today. No one got hit by an IED. Um, you know, you can listen right now. It is dead quiet. They live here? Where are they at right now? Yes, Shiraga and Agbajan are living over here. Where are they at? Yeah, for poppy fields. Yeah, they're getting that poppy juice. They walk. They work in the poppy field around here. Yes. It's already become the uh, the harvest is done. Then, if they're collecting the juice. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> there are things here that would make people back home be like, you know, what the heck i.e. where we are right now is covered in poppy fields, okay? And for those back home, poppies go to make heroin, all right? Um, this is one of the largest productive areas in the world for producing, you know, opium, which goes into heroin, all right? And there's a lot of marijuana fields out here, too. Um, a person in one year here in the Argon Dog that harvests a, a field of poppies uh, can make what in one year what they would do in three years doing pomegranates, which pomegranates is the other major major crop around here, okay? The uh, Afghan government, they, they'll have a plan, I'm sure, to come in if they want to change that. As far as counterinsurgency goes, it would be counterproductive for us to go in there and eliminate that field and say, these are bad, we're not going to let you do this, because now we've just created much more, or many more Taliban supporters. And that would be a shade of gray. Um, but to win the war against the Taliban, you just turn the cheek and continue with your mission. Then, out of nowhere, comes some startling news. Sir, someone alive is dead. What? We have a body. Where? Really? Where? It says unconfirmed. Then it says confirmed. The official has been not a dead. America! This is it. Yep, this is it. Yeah, it's been 10 years in September 11th. All this for that. Victory! Woo! I would say Americans won. Bin Laden is definitely zero. <laughs> I think that the death of Osama bin Laden or Osama bin Laden is more of a uh, symbolic uh, victory for us. He's really our face on terrorism, and that face is eliminated now. I really liked how the president went about it. He could have easily fired a missile from a predator somewhere and taken him out, but he chose to send a SEAL team in and, sh you know, <laughs> I, I hate to be so non-political, but shoot him in the face, you know, and then uh, take him out and drop him off in the ocean. I dig that. You know, I think um, the United States is very good at, at doing our best to be politically correct and taking care of people and, and being the ambassador of peace and being able to handle complex situations on top of that. And I think that's the way we should be, okay? But I think that there's sometimes you just need to go shoot him in the face. There's always a number two guy who is now the number one guy. And so, you know, it will continue. When the U.S. Army arrived to build their new base here, these buildings were held by Taliban fighters. Now they've fled and violence is much diminished. Both signs, perhaps, that the surge and counterinsurgency strategy are working. America has said it will start to reduce its forces later this year. That this is the end game. When they go, they'll leave a vacuum that the Afghan army may struggle to fill. The Taliban uh, seem uh, to have left Kandahar and the adjacent countryside to their enemies. Yet no one believes that they've gone for good. Clear. 
That's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on this film or anything else, we'd love to hear from you on aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time, bye-bye.